может быть, в компьютер? Потому что... Good afternoon, good evening to everyone. We are beginning our session, which is 38th session of Eurasian online seminar. Uh, we have some technical problems. Not everyone can enter the Zoom for some reason, but I think it's going to be solved because we have several speakers. So we have to change, uh, uh, ch ch change the order of the speakers. <clears throat> uh, the title of uh, today's uh, seminar is Building Confidence and Security, BRICS and the World Order. And we have uh, several speakers, actually four speakers today. Uh, the first one today would be will be uh, Professor Alexander Zhebit, who is Associate Professor of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro uh, and uh, author of several books on Brazilian foreign policy, Brazilian-Russian relations, and also some publications on the, on the BRICS. Uh, we have <clears throat> also Dmitry Trenin today, who is currently a research professor at High School of Economics here. Uh, in Moscow, used to be for quite some time uh, the director of the of Moscow Carnegie Center, uh, and is a, is very well known not only in Russia but outside Russia, of course, in the United States and many other countries as an expert on Russia's uh, Russian foreign policy, Russia's relations with the West, and uh, a lot of other topics. We should also have uh, Pawan Anand, Major General from India, a retired Army General, uh, who is also an expert on international relations and Indian foreign and security policy and an author of a lot of publications on these topics. And uh, Mr. Ruslan Pukhov, who is a well-known Russian defense anal uh, analyst and uh, director of Moscow-based Center for Analysis uh, of, Internet, uh, of Strategies and Technologies, which is a very well-known uh, Russian think tank. Uh, So we are basically going to discuss BRICS problems, but of course, uh, you are welcome to ask questions after the uh, after the main presentation of the speakers on any problem that you are interested in. Um, I think that speakers would speak uh, for like 15 minutes. Uh, this will should take about an hour, and then we'll have Q and A session as usual. Um, so we have a, a very impressive panel today, which represents three, uh, three of uh, five currently five BRICS countries, and I hope. Uh, that the discussion would be interesting and fruitful. My name is Alexander Lukin, by the way, for the record, and I'm head of the Department of International Relations at High School of Economics here in Moscow. Well, I'll give the floor to uh, Professor Zhebit, and then, uh, uh, because he's obviously here, and then we'll turn to other speakers. Professor Zhebit, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, President of the Chair. And uh, uh, I will start first uh, saying that I am honored to be invited to this uh, important, famous Eurasian seminar 
of Higher Stu School of Economics. And um, I also extend my uh, sincere greetings to the members of the panel, General Pawan Anand from India, Professor Dmitry Trenin and uh, Professor Puchov from Russia, and to all those present in the Zoom audience. I would like to uh, speak about Brazil and the BRICS security cooperation. And uh, uh, I, I've chosen an epigraph for it uh, from a speech of uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres uh, at Davos in uh, January 2023, who said, now more than ever, it's time to forge the pathways to cooperation in our fragmented world. So a few words uh, about new security consensus. It is moving now from state-centered to a people-centered axis after the Cold War. During the Cold War, military security was essential. After the Cold War, human security turned essential. Increasing human security means investing in human development, not in arms. This is what is said in the Human Development Report of 1994. People-centered form of security are the principal forms of human development, economic security, food security, environmental security, health security, personal security, information security, and of course, community security. That is that communities should be free from interstate and civil armed conflicts, transnational crime, international terrorism, mass destruction, arms proliferation, and other global threats. Uh, such a concept of security could not be taken for granted. First, human security is a basis on which the international security should be built. Second, this is not how it is really built. And third, the agenda of security is essential in building common security communities among states and interstate and non-state actors and bodies. In the real world, community security in terms of military security agenda should not be underestimated as it happened due to the euphoria of globalization. That is why we should speak about security cooperation, conscious of the gravest levels of geopolitical division and mistrust in generations. Nowadays, we live in a situation of a breach of confidence and security mechanisms between Europe and the world. European security is torn to pieces. Organization of security and cooperation in Europe is paralyzed. The Intermediate Range Nuclear Missiles Treaty was terminated by the United States of America. Open Skies Treaty was abandoned by the United States and Russia withdrew from it. Conventional Forces Re Re Reduction Treaty was revoked by Russia a few days ago, while the Western countries stopped observing this treaty more than a decade ago. And the new Nuclear Reduction Treaty of 2010 hangs on a thin thread only until 2026. Are these the reasons to sit with arms crossed to wait and see? On the contrary, the history shows that the time of crisis is propitious to act to overcome forces of war and violence and build a more secure world environment. Where, with whom? with those who wish peace, development, and security, nowadays positioned in the global South. Some historic analogies during the Cold War show the wisdom of the history. A world nuclear conflict quite imminent during the missiles crisis in 1962 was won through diplomacy and cooperation and was secured by installing red line phones on both sides first, and a series of treaties afterwards. In South Asia, in 1971, conflict between India and Pakistan was put to halt, albeit temporarily, thanks to the adopted confidence measures in the 
1972 simpler agreement. The conflict between the two superpowers during the Cold War was driven to solution by the Helsinki process, Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, through Madrid, Vienna, and Stockholm conferences that elaborated and established confidence and security measures on both sides of the Iron Curtain. And this was crucial to end the first Cold War. In Latin America, the Rio group, the Contadora group, established a diplomatic context that created a bigger political confidence within the region, now fortified by the creation of UNASUR and CELAC, community of Latin American and Caribbean states. Some recent historic examples, uh, post-Cold War, uh, post uh, economic integration institutions have acquired characteristics of common security communities, among them Mercosur, European Union, ECOWAC, Economic Community of West African Countries, Asian, and also nuclear free zones, free trade areas, and other integrations. The main feature that brought members of these communities together was the development of mutual confidence and trust among states to prevent or at least reduce the likelihood of wars, armed conflicts and hostilities and grow and develop on this basis. Mechanisms and measures elaborated among the states that had chosen to form common security communities contributed to, conf to conflict prevention, crisis response and more effective security building in a broad sense of human security fight against global threats, building peace and prosperity through development. Confidence building measures are regarded as alternatives to traditional diplomatic business, which can be halted due to numerous factors, among them a trust deficit, security concerns, and stalemates in negotiations. Some words about the BRICS and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. These two governance bodies are not military, military alliances, although they have a broad security agenda. But it's a different security agenda, not directed against whomsoever. If the BRICS has an agenda of facing global threats as terrorism, climate crisis, transnational organized crime, and nuclear proliferation, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization also wields a practice of conflict resolution, as with Afghanistan, Iran, and Central Asia dispute. The present uh, world crisis put these two organizations in the global south against new challenges, as a new Cold War, unilateral sanctions, energy and food crisis, climate change doomsday, post-COVID-19 recovery, and the big divide between the West and the rest, as well as inside the two unequal global South. The challenge is to build security communities based not only on proclaiming mutual trust and common security, but building and enforcing confidence and security objectives, principles, and concrete measures. Diplomatic initiatives are not new. In 1996, Russia, China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan established an agreement on confidence building in the military field in the border area. The famous Kazakhstan initiative, 1999, gave birth to SICA, Conference on Interactions and Confidence Building Measures in Asia in 2002, uh, in which participate 28 member states many observer states and international bodies. It is a successful movement of trust building. Brazil, as a member state of the BRICS, is conscious of the necessity of confidence and security building. Considering that Brazil is far from Eurasian geographical area, should it be concerned with confidence and security measures eventually proposed by the Eurasian partners? First, Confidence is not about geography, but about non-use of force and of threat of force 
in pluridimensional environment from global development, sustainable climate, provision of food, energy resources, information, and technology to human lives, property, rights, and interests in a world of human security communities in any geographic or geopolitical contexts. Second, mutual confidence and common security are essential principles of a moral paradigm of international peace in a democratic, undivided, and more just world order. They create bridges of dialogue, safe cooperation, guarantees of community values and interests. Third, Eurasian and South American diplomatic, political, and social environments are open and favorable to building new and fortifying existing confidence and security measures. Brazil is a central power in the regional security complex in South America. Its military expenditures in 2019 uh, were about $26.8 billion, or 1.5% of GDP. It ranked the country's 11th as 11th in the world for defense spending. Brazil is a producer and exporter of conventional weapons to Afghanistan, Indonesia, Lebanon, Philippines, worth around $300 million in 2019, and an importer of military equipment, mainly from France, Germany, United States, Sweden, Spain, Israel, Italy, United Kingdom, and Russia. The country has the complete uranium enrichment cycle in Rosenda, Rio de Janeiro state, and at the same time is part of new agenda coalition, which advocates the general and complete nuclear disarmament, together with Brazil's staunch position on nuclear non-proliferation. At the same time, Brazil is pursuing a project of a nuclear propulsion submarine, eventually joining the club of nuclear powered submarines countries by 2030. It still pursues a balance of power policy due to an, an insecure environment in the Northern part of South America, characterized by internal conflicts in Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru. That makes Brazil maintain defense capacities and modernize its armed forces. At the same time, Brazil was successful in building a security community with states of the Southern Cone of South America. The Brazilian Argentine Agency, ABAC, as a common system of accounting and control of nuclear materials is the result of a transparency process in nuclear programs conducted by Argentina and Brazil, which put an end to a geopolitical rivalry in the Southern Cone through peaceful nuclear cooperation. Nowadays, a Brazilian-Argentine partnership is a cornerstone of security in South America. There is a partial security community in the Latin American region specifically in the southern, southern cone among Argentina, Brazil, Paraguay, Uruguay, which formed the Mercosur economic bloc in 1991, plus Chile, where regimes on security and defense, democratic institutions, confidence building measures, and economic institutions have developed significantly since the 90s. It is also uh, fortified by the South American Defense Council, under the umbrella of the Union of South American Nations, UNASUR, which was established in 2008. So people in South America maintain the, maintain the expectation that the members of the community will not fight each other and will resolve any conflict by peaceful means. There is also a transatlantic security community called Zopas, ZOPACAS, Zone of Free uh, of peace and cooperation in South Atlantic. ZOPACAS was created in 1986 through a resolution of the UN General Assembly on Brit Brazil's initiative, the country with most powerful Navy in the region. The aim is promoting greater regional cooperation for economic and social development, environmental protection, conservation of maritime resources, 
and of the maintenance of peace and security in the South Atlantic region. Particular attention uh, is being given to preventing the geographical proliferation of nuclear weapons and reducing and eventually eliminating the military presence of countries from other regions. Zopacas has 24 member states, three South American and 21 Western and South African countries. This area is vital for Brazil and for the global South. And it includes the uh, exclusive economic zone uh, of Brazil with archipelagos called the Blue Amazon. And the last but not the least, the Antarctic, Antarctic Treaty, which precludes any military activities and nuclear testing in the region. What are the confidence building measures in Brazilian so-called military diplomacy? Brazil showed relevant examples of employing regional and extra-regional confidence building measures uh, since 2000. Brazil accomplished military trainings with Andean neighbor, neighboring countries of concern for its diplomacy and security, Colombia, Venezuela, Peru. Brazil launched the country's first national defense white book to make transparent its policy of modernization of armed forces and military procure, procurement. Brazil led the MINUSTAR UN peacekeeping operation in Haiti since its beginning in 2004 until the end in 2017, and participated in other 50 missions during the history of United Nations peacekeeping operations. Brazil has bilateral military relations. Uh, in 2007, it, the country decided, decided to modernize and upgrade its armed forces through a strategic relationship with France, buying diesel, uh, submarines, and helicopters. In 2016, the country made a huge contract to buy Swedish fighter jets, Gripen NG. It imports uh, military equipment, mainly from the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, also France, Israel, and Italy. Well, diversifying its imports, Brazil maintains uh, the autonomy of imports. So that is that it would not depend on one or only few uh, suppliers. This country's position in relation to defense and security is compatible with its natural and economic greatness and with its role as a regional leader which is concerned with the regional stability and with its safe international environment. There are bilateral intra-BRICS military agreements. India and Brazil signed an agreement in 2003 for cooperation in defense, especially in the field of research and development, acquisition and logistics support, military training and exercises between the two countries. In 2008 and 2012, Brazil signed two agreements on military cooperation with Russia and maintains a dense cooperation with Russia on a number of issues. Two plus two meetings between Russia and China, Russia and India are common. The first two plus two meeting between Russia and Brazil took place in February 2022 during the presidential visit to Moscow. The bilateral documents signed by Brazil in military matters mention confidence and security building on a bilateral basis. So uh, coming to an end, I want to say one more thing, and it uh, deals with the expansion of the BRICS. With the view of the BRICS expansion and the Shanghai Cooperation Organ Organization evolution, an adoption of paradigm of confidence and security building among the BRICS and Shanghai Cooperation Organization countries would be a strong moral and legal incentive of safe and inclusive communities for the countries that aspire to join these groups, either with development objectives, which will be facilitated by the BRICS New Development Bank and China's Asian Development Bank, or with the purpose 
of living in a more peaceful environment established on the basis of measures of confidence and security, verifiable and transparent in terms of environment, economy, finances, energy, food, information and human rights, and also military affairs that create a security community. The objectives, principles, and measures of confidence and security building to be duly debated and consensually approved will resemble the experience that led to a creation of successful Pacific security communities that have been emerging since the 70s and the 90s. In this new global development distribution, Brazil will contribute to strengthening a co cooperative and active multilateralism consistent with its historical and traditional position of defending the normative integrity of the international system and of the central role of the United Nations in which Brazil claims a permanent position in the UN Security Council. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jebet, for such an interesting uh, presentation and also <clears throat> giving us, uh, letting us understand more about uh, Brazil's views and position because <clears throat> not many people in this part of the world know it very well, I would say. Uh, well, now we have uh, luckily uh, Dmitry Trenin here with us. Finally, uh, Dmitry Vitalievich, uh, I don't think you actually need an introduction, but uh, just to be on the safe side, I've already introduced you. Uh, but uh, in your in your absence, and uh, you should you can be sure that I haven't said anything bad, only good words about you. So please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lukin. Um, first of all, I uh, need to apologize for coming late to this party. Uh, that was probably that was not in uh, in the remarks that you had made about me, but I'm uh, technologically not very competent, I must confess. So it took me some time to uh, to um, uh, make to activate my Zoom link. Anyway. Uh, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be part of this uh, esteemed panel. And um, I very much enjoyed the uh, presentation by Professor Jebit. And um, I, I particularly salute his um, commitment to the idea of uh, security communities. Uh, I think this is something that uh, we should all be uh, thinking about and uh, and and working uh, to uh, uh, expand the existing communities and to found the communities in the places where they are much needed, but not present. I must tell you that in my previous uh, uh, previous role as a longtime director of the Carnegie Moscow Center, uh, that goes back about well. Um, more than more than a decade, maybe uh, 12, 13 years, and somewhat maybe somewhat more than that, my colleagues and I launched an initiative that we playfully called EASY, which stood for Euro Atlantic Security Initiative. The idea was to come up with a formula that would allow the countries of uh, Europe, the United States, and Russia to chart a road to a um, secure uh, neighborliness. Um, and at that time, we thought that uh, we had two things that uh, we could uh, uh, prioritize in order to get there. And those things were, uh, those of you with long memories would recall that uh, uh, in the late 2000s, one of the pressing issues and more controversial issues in on the international security agenda, certainly between the United States and Russia, was the issue of ballistic missile defenses. Uh, so we thought that uh, 
uh, U.S., Russian, U.S., uh, Europe, Russian collaboration on uh, joint ballistic missile defenses would give us the clue, the, um, the um, uh, would open the path to a relationship that will be essentially demilitarized. Russia will not be a member of NATO as, uh, um, as, as some people, including uh, President Putin, I should say, uh, suggested at the beginning of this, uh, of this century, but uh, nor would it be in, a, in an adversarial relationship with NATO because the, uh, air, the, the, the ballistic missile defense system of uh, the United States, uh, NATO countries in Europe and Russia would be joined. And that would give you the benefits of being in an alliance without being in an alliance, without having to accept the leadership of one nation. And the second thing we worked on was uh, reconciliation in Eastern Europe, the reconciliation between Russia and Poland, uh, Russia and the Baltic states, and um, uh, and and uh, a formula for uh, Ukraine, which would um, um, support the idea of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty while making that sovereignty a non-issue in security terms for Russia. And in those days, I think we we assembled a very good group, a few dozen people, uh, including some former foreign ministers, uh, former defense ministers, former chiefs of intelligence, including of the United States and Russia, to uh, uh, join in an effort to bring this forward. Unfortunately, by uh, 2011, I think, or 20, certainly by 2012, we understood that that effort had fallen through, primarily through the uh, reluctance um, uh, on the U.S. side, I should say, to dilute U.S. control of the um, European missile defense system. So there was no way to have uh, Russia join uh, if that accession also meant that Russia would be a decision maker. And certainly for Russia, that was the only condition for joining the whole project. Um, and I must say that uh, ever since, and we're talking about, well, 12 years since uh, the spring of 2011, when it all, all, all fell through, despite the declaration of a strategic partnership between Russia and NATO that was made in Lisbon in 2010, we've been um, going downhill and downhill. And I, uh, toward the end of my tenure at Carnegie, I came up with a phrase that uh, a lot of people um, later quoted that things uh, were going to be, were going to get worse before they will get even worse. And um, that I think led us to the situation where we are today. So I'm very, um, positive on the issue of security communities, but I'm also informed by my own and my colleagues' experience in actually trying to build such a security community. And uh, I think that uh, we need to learn from those lessons as well. Uh, Professor Jebet talked about uh, the uh, UN-centric model of world security, which again is, uh, is another uh, very positive thing. And Russia's foreign policy concept, even the, the most recent edition of the concept um, refers to a, a, a UN-centric world order. And of course, we all know that this uh, world, such a world order never actually existed, that that was a, a dream, a project uh, initiated by uh, President Roosevelt of the United States, Franklin Roosevelt, it was supported by uh, uh, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom in those days, but uh, this never actually um, uh, resulted in, in a real world order. The five the famous five policemen and the Security Council's permanent uh, group 
uh, never got their act together. And uh, international tensions, uh, interests, uh, ambitions of various players uh, pre precluded the United Nations from becoming the center of international, uh, of, of, of world order. And uh, I, I think that we should have no illusions about the international uh, system, or the world order rather, being uh, built not on some uh, ideals, uh, however, however nice and good and just and uh, forward looking they may be, but on the real distribution of uh, power resources. Prior to the Second World War, of course, we had a multipolar order uh, built on a balance of power. Uh, this uh, led to two world wars. Uh, the, 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 the order could not be maintained in that, in that system. And of course, uh, many of us have lived through the, uh, the, the period that uh, followed the Second World War, and that was the, the period of uh, uh, bipolarity built on essentially the balance of terror between the two nuclear superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And uh, right after the, the end of the Cold War and the dissolution of the USSR, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we, for the first time in human history, uh, experienced a global order built around one super powerful nation, the United States. We had a, an Amer a US centric world order. I think what we uh, are witnessing now is a shift, which is a gathering pace to uh, a new world order and uh, a, lot of, a lot of people and uh, some key governments, including the, uh, the, the Russian one, talk about a multipolar world order. Well, I think that uh, uh, if multipolarity means that uh, there'll be no hegemony of any one nation in the world, that's, uh, that's something to be supported and something that, uh, that, that needs to be uh, at the center of, uh, of, of our efforts, because uh, unipolarity certainly stifles the development in like any monopoly would stifle the development of, of others. But uh, uh, the idea of replacing the rule of one nation with a cabal of uh, several nations, let's say a committee, an oligarchy, however you may define it, is not such a great prospect. So I think that uh, the idea that is often heard in the South America, that of um, um, multilateralism rather than multipolarity, is certainly something to be um, uh, to be highlighted so much more. I don't think that the countries in BRICS uh, view themselves or should view themselves as the as the new um, leadership group in the world. Uh, I think they uh, they may see themselves as leaders in taking the world to a better future, but the end goal should not be, and I don't think it is, establishing uh, uh, an oligarchical rule by uh, several non-Western nations, which certainly uh, has uh, little to no chance of becoming a reality. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time, but... Uh, I will highlight just one thing, which I believe uh, uh, the nations of BRICS uh, need to be focusing on. Uh, the world order is what it is, and meaning that it is uh, in flux, meaning that it is uh, shifting from uh, the dominance of the United States and its uh, friends in the West to uh, a more inclusive uh, system. Uh, some people would say a more democratic system, if, if, if the term democracy can be applied to geopolitics, I'm not sure of that. But um, uh, rather than waiting for the moment when there's a new uh, balance of power in the world, um, rather than doing that, I think it would be, it, actually, it is a great, uh, uh, a great idea of starting to build a, a new um, security communities, new uh, 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 security systems in, uh, in, in various parts of the world. And I want to highlight the 
the mission of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as the uh, as 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 the organization that includes uh, uh, by now um, many, if not all, the uh, principal um, powers of continental Asia, and uh, I think that uh, uh, the world order, the new world order, built on multilateralism and uh, and. Um, is chewing a hegemony by any one nation uh, could be built and should be built within uh, or under the aegis of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It has a, a very rich and I should say tough agenda. Uh, the countries that uh, make up the organization do not always have a very um, smooth and very friendly relations among themselves, but this is a challenge that uh, can bring things forward. And I very much welcome the, uh, the effort of, uh, by, uh, by New Delhi and Beijing to sort out uh, the problems between those two great powers and uh, launch uh, a more cooperative, more constructive relations across the Himalaya. Uh, certainly Pakistan, another major uh, power in that part of the world uh, is also part of uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and and as I as I understand, some uh, uh, some steps are being taken between uh, New Delhi and Islamabad to uh, improve the relationship. Uh, the accession of Iran uh, is another important uh, factor in expanding the uh, the. Um, the field of uh, uh, the emerging security community. So let me uh, let me uh, conclude by saying that uh, maybe the most important uh, uh, takeaway that uh, uh, I can offer you on the strength of my uh, limited as it is experience is that rather than uh, uh, than waiting for the moment when everything becomes uh, what you want it to be, uh, you should do what you can do. And uh, unfortunately, what you can do today does not include reviving the notion of a Euro-Atlantic security community. I, I, unfortunately, I have to, to submit to you that the conflict between Russia and the West uh, is likely to last uh, quite a while and is likely to bring um, a lot of trouble to, uh, to both... Uh, uh, parties and, uh, and the nations in between. But uh, this should not um, uh, th this should not hamper our efforts to do good where we can do, do where we can do good. And I think that uh, highlighting uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization as, in my view, uh, a regional element of uh, the global BRICS um, system. Uh, so Brazil and South Africa are very much welcome to look into what uh, the Shanghai uh, countries are doing and um, and participate in, in that work. But uh, security community in Eurasia built around uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, I think, is, uh, is a useful step, a major useful step toward building a new world order, which I hope will be more secure. And hopefully at some point it will even include uh, the countries that are um, antagonistic to one another as they are today. So let me stop here and uh, I thank you for uh, your, your time. Well, thank you very much, Professor Trenin, for such a comprehensive overview of the international situation and the role of uh, non-Western countries, I would say, and organizations like Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is especially important uh, for me personally, because I've been studying it for a long time. So hopefully uh, it's going to be uh, more active. Uh, I mean, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and other non-Western organizations. Uh, now we should have uh, General Anand with us. 
Is he here? Or he was here? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm here, Professor. Yes, yes, but something happened with your video. Ah, ah, now it's OK, yes. So I've already introduced you. So basically, the floor is yours. If, if the video is no good, you can just switch it off. We can just listen to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I think my video is uh, giving problems, and uh, it's a little distracting, so I shall switch it off. Thank you, Professor uh, Lucan, for giving me the floor. Uh, I've been hearing about you, uh, and it's a pleasure to meet you uh, online, virtually, whatever. And uh, it's been a pleasure to listen to uh, my recent friends, uh, Professor Alexander Zabit and uh, Professor Threnin. Uh, while uh, Professor Zebeth has uh, very nicely covered the aspects, uh, the broader aspects of what he thinks are community security and other forms of security, he's also brought out a lot about how Brazil fits into uh, uh, some sort of a security architecture in South America, and uh, therefore by translation into uh, other parts of the world. Uh, and I uh, particularly also look at what Professor Trenin spoke of in terms of the efforts that were there for security to be developed uh, over a period of time in Europe, as well as in Central Asia. Uh, this also included security issues in South Asia, which uh, have now gone on to the back burner for a while. But there are issues which remain, albeit uh, irritants, between China and India. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, begin by saying that I am now going to focus on Russia and India's relationship mainly in the background of various multilateral groupings that we are in, besides our own uh, bilateral relationship. So the first thing is uh, I found as, I, uh, as I've been reading through that six seems to be a very unique number between Russia and India. And I put it in one of my publications. So six is unique because India abstained six times from voting in resolutions against Russia in the last one year at the UN General Assembly. And I would also like to say that from 1957 to 19... When times get difficult and uncertain, two nations can resolutely stand by each other and attempt their way together through multilateral forums. That's what study friends do. And that's how it has been between Russia and India. The pandemic in 2020, military operations in Ukraine and heightened tensions in the Indo-Pacific region over the last three years have caused tumultuous effects. We've also witnessed a kind of vaccine apartheid during the, co the COVID pandemic. And I may dare say that it has managed to shake the faith of the global South in what kind of support it is going to receive from the developed nations. Indeed, the chimera of global equality and equitable growth opportunities definitely seems to have faded. Human rights appears to be now used as a pressure tool in diplomacy. And there is a lot of debate on alternative forms of governance. Economies have been weaponized. Some have been permanently altered. And there is an inevitable, inevitable path to an interdependent globalized trade system that thought has faded into the background. Bretton Woods institutions appear to be now a bit powerless, a bit weak, and I think are making attempts to survive or remain relevant. All this needs close attention. The seemingly robust global supply chains have suddenly got disrupted, and nations are scrambling to de-risk, in quotes, and improve resilience in trade strategies. All in all, the current global order is in the throes of a long drawn process of reordering. And each one of us is reevaluating our positions in realigned groups, perhaps. 
in these uncertain times, as was also mentioned by Professor Alexander Zabit, I think strong opportunities get thrown up and strong relationships begin to grow. India's and Russia's relationships have entered a phase of re-evaluation. Will they grow or will they ferment? That time will tell. But history has a way of telling us how it will go. So in October 2000, President Putin signed the Declaration of Strategic Partnership between India and Russia, enhancing levels of cooperation between us in the political, security, defense, trade and economy, science and technology and culture. In 2010, it has been elevated to a special and privileged strategic relationship. Ukraine has put this relationship to test, if I may, but India has shown that it has been a staunch supporter. Even if it believes that boundaries between nations need to be respected and issues need to, need to be resolved by other means, it is in this context that I would like you to see the Prime Minister of India's statement, Mr. Modi's statement, that today is not an era of war. Our relations between the two countries apparently are edificed on three pillars, international strategy and diplomacy, trade, which includes military technical cooperation and energy. But I say that besides this, we are looking at a large amount of economic cooperation. We have a convergence in seeing that there is a multipolar global order. And we have security concerns on our borders, which are similar. In the new foreign policy concept, which has come out from Russia, there is an emphasis on traditional, spiritual, and moral values, which resonates with India. We also see a sharp flip from the West, from the West to the East, and the focus appears to be in priority on China, India, and Southeast Asia. So while realignments are taking place in Eurasia and the Middle East, despite being ridden by major divisions, the RIC or the Russia-India-China trilateral also appears to gain some prominence. Of course, the BRICS membership is looking for expansion. There are 19 countries which want to come in. Maybe seven of them are going to be considered in the next summit. The Saudi-Iran rapprochement is a new uh, challenge which has been resolved apparently by China. And the world sees it that China and Russia are going into an embrace with a no limits partnership. Turkey appears to be a balancer. Being a NATO member, it appears to be opportunistic by going towards both sides. But what, what is clear now from the Russian side is there is a pragmatism towards the East and there is a hardened position towards the West. And this was adequately brought out by Professor Trenin. There is also an attempt to shift focus towards the Indo-Pacific. One of the latest things that I noted was that the European Union or NATO, I stand corrected, NATO plans to set up an office in Japan. Korea and Japan are reconsidering arming themselves and even considering nuclear capabilities indigenously. Of course, the US nuclear umbrella still remains on them. But the fact that their populations are reconsidering or reevaluating shows clearly which way the population is looking. The Philippines have now given their bases, additional bases, to the Americans. That seems to be work in progress. So apart from the five rotational bases that they already had, we are now looking at five more, which are going to be austere kind of bases that look at an agile format for deployment of the US-based weapon systems. 
Let me just look at this multipolar world order that we converge on. The containment strategy of proxy players in Ukraine against Russia seems to be working in the short term. And it has succeeded in unifying Europe. They have increased their expenditure on developing defense capabilities and NATO coffers are now being filled up by European budgets. This may not last in the long term though, as many of them will continue to depend on Russian resources and energy supplies, even if they are doing so even now indirectly. The crisis that has been brought upon Russia by a swath of sanctions will remain for a while it appears, but Russia's focus to Eurasia towards the heartland and its Asian partners does now to us appear to be a marked shift and a shift over a long period of time. It is my belief that the US and the Western allies view India as a balancer in the Indo-Pacific, creating an alternative power center perhaps to China in a regional context. They may wish to even see India involved in a military confrontation should that come up. But I would dare say that India would not be in a hurry to enter any such conflict in the Indo-Pacific. In fact, India is looking to resolve its issues with China through bilateral arrangements. Yeah, and if I may add in a very quiet tone, India knows that it would not like to be a Ukraine-like proxy in the East. There are other countries also who do consider that proposition and are making sure that they do not enter that ground. I can see that kind of a sentiment in Korea and Japan as well. When we look at multilateral fora, uh, I think there are the SCO, the BRICS and the RIC where we find a lot of convergences and divergences emerging between nations. While the SCO has huge implications on trade possibilities in Eurasia and a lot of cooperation at the diplomatic level, we do see the North-South Corridor from Moscow to Mumbai, the INSTC and the Vladivostok Chennai Sea Link as getting operationalized and as becoming emerging what I would call corridors of prosperity. The SCO also enables India and perhaps Russia to raise anti-terrorism issues which was known to be one of the basic original agendas of the SCO. Mr. Jay Shankar, the Foreign Minister of India, has reminded members during the last meeting in India itself of the SCO that terror were, was one of the original mandates of the SCO and state actors cannot be allowed to hide behind non-state actors. While this may point in the direction of one country, it also points in the direction of those who refrain from calling them out. A common anti-terror agenda is inevitable. And if this grouping is to have meaning, then the anti-terror agenda does take precedence. As far as BRICS is concerned, I think it's one of the most vibrant groups that we have with the five state members now. It represents 41.5% of the global population and 32.5% of global GDP, PPP. It seems to be the closest the South can get to the G7 kind of representation. In the first formal summit that was held in Yekaterinburg in 2009, the idea of a new global reserve currency was mooted and I note that it immediately resulted in the fall of a dollar. The current refrain of de-dollarization, which the BRICS is picking up, is probably likely to have a similar impact. There has been talk about decoupling the dollar. It appears to be impractical in the near term, perhaps even in the midterm. But still, 
there is talk about de dollarization. What has brought this about? I think the weaponization of the dollar first happened in 1944 with the Bretton Woods institutions. In 1971, when the dollar was depegged from gold, it lent great power to it and it's, it was used as a weapon of choice. It is in 2022 when the dollar has finally been fully weaponized. And that has started many countries thinking as to whether they need to have that full dependence on a single reserve currency. I think in the next summit in South Africa in August this year, this will be one of the major refrains. There has been talk about uh, a BRICS currency, but what will probably emerge in the, um, in the shorter run uh, would be the use of each other's currencies in dealings between us. What needs to be probably kept in mind is that as we go into this area, we need to ensure that there is yet not another dominant currency which comes up, but there is a basket of currencies which balance each other out and do not give undue power to any one nation. And with this, I would say we need to care that it doesn't become a bipolar currency in terms of dollars and yuan zone. We would have to deal in rupees, in, in, uh, in the Brazilian currency, in, in the South African currency perhaps, and finally come up with the BRICS currency whenever that comes up. What I found interesting also was the dependence that the Russian trade bodies did on cryptocurrencies when sanctions were imposed. And probably a cryptocurrency would be the way forward finally as a BRICS currency. As far as uh, Russia, India, China trilateral is concerned, I think the RIC has languished, mainly due to divergences between India and China, and that too on border issues. Recently, the Indian and Chinese foreign ministers got to meet on the sidelines of the SCO. The Chinese side sought to project that the border situation is, in quotes, generally stable and therefore everything else could go on between our two countries. India has categorically stated that the border situation is abnormal and until the disengagement process is carried forward and until peace and tranquility remains disturbed, all other activities cannot be considered under a pretense of normalcy. China's possible strategies could be taken as bleeding out India's economy, maybe tiring out its armed forces by long deployments along its 3,500 kilometer long border. But all these seem to be counterproductive. In the current Ukraine crisis, Moscow is being shown, perhaps by some, as Beijing's junior partner, which is unthinkable. The third player in this trilateral is quite obviously Russia. While India and China will be, will be looking to resolve the problems between each other, I think Russia has a very weighty role to play. After all, in a triangle, an equilateral triangle is equally balanced in the sense that all three poles are equally powerful. We cannot have a unipolar Asia. It has to be a multipolar Asia as well. So it is predicated that all three players in the trial in the trilateral enjoy equal status. It, it may be in keeping to mention that India being part of the Quad does not mean that India has India has gone into an adversarial mode with China. Being in the Quad does not guarantee India's military participation in the South China Sea. And that needs to be made note of by China. Just a quick look at a trade and technology exchanges between Russia and India. Well, India is now the fifth largest economy globally. 
and by a growth rate of 6% is likely to be the third largest economy by 2030 as per an EY report of January this year. We have a 1.4 billion population, which is almost fully digitally enabled. It's a huge market. The internal demand of India itself will drive growth and sustain the economy. Two thirds of India's energy consumption is likely to be by renewable sources by 2030. Massive investment opportunity awaits people who come into India. As far as technology goes, there has been an aggressive movement by a number of Western companies to get into joint ventures and co-production arrangements with India for manufacture, not only in civilian, but also defense companies. Russia has traditionally been India's defense equipment supplier. It was earlier pegged at 68% of our equipment it has come down now to 59% and likely to go lower if deliveries from Russia are delayed. Despite the Ukraine crisis, an expedited delivery would put things back in place. India is looking for self-reliance and is banking on technology transfers, collaborative R&D, as was done with the BrahMos missile between Russia and India, co-development, and co-production for state-of-the-art technologies. I may underline that dependence on any one country is not an option for India. Our economic interests are coupled with geostrategic convergences. So France and the US are offering technologies and coming as manufacturing partners. It needs to be seen what is the level of their sincerity as well. Russia must note that India is a proven, reliable, long-term partner in maintaining IPs and technology transfer arrangements. We have a whole set of equipment which is common to each other, but we need to take it to the next level of collaborative R&D in state-of-the-art technologies, fifth-generation stealth aircraft, frigates, metallurgies, high-performance engines, air-independent propulsion technologies for naval vessels, and so on. I have been a member of the IRIGC MTC uh, between our two countries, the Indo-Russian Intergovernmental Committees. And I have witnessed firsthand the warmth that is there and also the problems that come up. We need to make the IRIGC system a little more agile, a little more business friendly and uh, this may require changes in legislation, both in Russia and India. If we are able to maintain our traditional defense relationship, we will not drift apart. And we will, unless India is forced to look elsewhere to maintain its operational readiness. The last point I want to mention is about a reviewed nuclear deterrence paradigm. I think the Ukraine crisis has certainly brought about certain changes in thought about the nuclear deterrence paradigm. There are forward deployments of weaponized vectors on the western borders of Russia. And I think the reduced reaction times have raised the chances of a conflagration. It is restarting the nuclear arms race and raising the specter of the use of tactical nuclear weapons and dirty bombs. Its implications will not be only in Europe. They will spread to other parts of the world. And India would definitely be watching it very carefully. At least one aspect in this would be that we need to ensure that nuclear weapons do not fall into the wrong hands. They are in the hands of responsible governments and not in the hands of non-state actors. For this, an active intelligence sharing uh, process or procedure needs to be put in place. I think I may have said enough, but I would like to conclude with saying that India and Russia share a strategic relationship which has been built up over a large period of time. 
Minister Jay Shankar had mentioned just a couple of days ago that the relationship between India and China uh, and, and Russia is the steadiest of relationships that have been seen between countries in a very long time. It is drawing much attention, not because it has changed, but because it has not changed. Uh, I'm open to questions after this, but thank you very much, Professor Lucan. Well, thank you very much, General Anand, for a very interesting presentation of Indian views on the international situation, including the Quad and, you know, Indo-Pacific problems, which are quite, which we follow with great interest from here, I would say. Um, now, I don't think that Mr. Puchov has joined us. Maybe I don't see him. Uh, Sorry, I also slightly. Oh, yes, yes, uh, yes. Now I, now I can see you, but you indicates, but, and I also joined with a delay. Yes, but for some reason you use another name, so that's why uh, you come as an Alexander Orban, but, but it, it does matter. <laughs> so, Sorry. It's so you are welcome. Uh, you are welcome to give your thoughts on the problems that we discussed today. We have already introduced you uh, in your absence, but only from a very positive side. Uh, well. uh, since I'm not a uh, professor, uh, they don't have PhD and I'm kind of practical uh, expert working in the area of international arms trade and defense industry cooperation, I can give you just a brief uh, overview of uh, my um, forecast and my vision how the military technical cooperation between Russia and BRICS countries will go in the future. Yeah, uh, Of course, I don't have crystal ball, uh, but it looks like once uh, the hostilities in Ukraine are over, Russia will uh, need uh, to... Uh, to go in the new cycle of rearmament uh, due to uh, tangible losses of equipment, uh, especially uh, equipment for the ground forces, for the infantry. And since in certain areas uh, Russia is uh, lagging behind, uh, Russian defense industry is not uh, equally advanced in all areas. And if we have probably the most important and most um, uh, technologically advanced and combat proven uh, air defense systems, starting from manually portable air defense up to sub-strategic systems like uh, S-400, uh, in certain areas like gunpowder, uh, like small arms and light weapons, we are uh, lagging behind. And since uh, the majority of uh, BRICS uh, countries uh, developed uh, extremely good niche capabilities, uh, what comes in mind, it's like uh, Taurus pistols from uh, Brazil, uh, certain type of the equipment uh, from South Africa, uh, unfortunately, South African defense industrial complex uh, is going through uh, kind of systemic crisis due to several reasons, but they still have uh, some residual capabilities which, which, which can be of, of interest for Russian armed forces and uh, other power, power ministries. Uh, India made a tremendous uh, leap uh, the last uh, decade and a half, and uh, since India is a country which is a recipient of the technologies not only from the East, uh, as we call it, Eastern technologies, yeah, well, countries like Russia, Poland, Ukraine, many others, but also from the West, like United States, France, India can offer uh, quite a variety of uh, uh, of weapon uh, for Russia. Since there is a big trust between Russia um, uh, and India in the area of uh, defense technology transfers, I dare to remind you that uh, India is the only country uh, which uh, got 
from Russia, the technology of nuclear propulsion, I mean the leasing of nuclear powered submarine, both in uh, Soviet times and, and currently uh, under modern Russia. Uh, India made several uh, successful uh, export breakthroughs last uh, couple of years, and it would be possible to see how this uh, equipment perform in Armenia and in some other countries. That's why uh, I think India has a very interesting prospect on, on Russian um, arms, arms market, and obviously China. China with a variety of weapons, uh, not all uh, Chinese weapons are combat proven, and they still have uh, big lacunas in certain in certain areas. But still, Russia can fill this gap first by urgent um, purchases, and then join production, which will aim Russian market. We have an excellent example with India of um, joint development of uh, supersonic. Uh, multi-platform cruise missile uh, in the framework of Brahma's uh, joint venture. But to tell the truth, it was likely or largely uh, transfer of Russian, uh, Soviet and Russian uh, advanced uh, supersonic uh, technologies to India. Uh, but this time it can be joint production or even vice versa. That's why uh, I see the, the bright future for military technical cooperation between our countries. Uh, but this time uh, uh, in, the, in the opposite direction, which to my mind uh, has nothing to be ashamed. Yeah? As certain observers said that Russia never was importing uh, armament, this is true. Uh, only for a short period of uh, end of Soviet Union, beginning of the Russian newly re-established Russia, Russian Federation. Historically, since uh, the creation of centralized Russia, Russia was always the recipient of uh, foreign high-tech and high-hume technologies, Stuck, starting from importing officers under Peter the Great and strategic materials, like bronze and rare earth materials, up to modern uh, technologies, uh, propulsion, uh, naval construction. That's why historically for us, uh, we have institutional memory of arms import. So on this uh, kind of positive and high note, uh, I would like uh, to conclude my remarks and once again apologize for being uh, equally technically not 100% uh, skillful as uh, as Dr. Trenin, I am in a, in a good uh, in a good company. I also joined uh, with a uh, with some delay, and I obviously would be happy to see the recording later on to, to, to complete my uh, my knowledge of what I missed. Thank you very Thank you. much, uh, Mr. Puchov, uh, for such a technology-oriented, I would say, uh, presentation, which is very interesting for us ordinary people who, do, who know nothing about it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, well, I think we'll have some time uh, for Q&A session now. All our speakers are here. And uh, if someone has a question, you are welcome either to make me see it or by writing it to the chat. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. Hmm. I, oh, yes, the, Sergei Rachenko wants to ask a question. Sergei, uh, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, thank you for uh, fabulous presentations. Very interesting to, uh, to listen to these different perspectives. Um, I guess I'll be the, the, the first to, to break the ice with questions. Uh, my question to, to the panelists is this. 
Um, there, there is a view in the West uh, currently that Russia is becoming progressively dependent on China, whether it's in the sphere of energy resources, whether politically it's becoming beholden to Beijing. What would you make of of this argument? You know, is it is it fair to say that Russia is losing um, its autonomy? Uh, or would you counter this narrative and say, no, no, Russia is doing just fine. And the fact that it has sort of turned away from the West towards China has not limited Russia's options. Thank you. Uh, can, I, can I try to respond to that? Professor Lukin. I don't hear you. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. I my 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 the sound was switched off. Of course you can. And I think uh, from the point of view of uh, technology maybe Mr. Puho will do, later add something. Please right. go. Uh, well, I think that um, uh, first of all uh, what's happening in Russia is uh, a very fast moving process of uh, sovereignization. We, uh, most of us had a very little idea of how dependent Russia was on the West. In so many areas, in so many cases, to such a degree that, uh, uh, so it was a learning experience that, uh, right up until uh, last February, February 22, that is, uh, Russia was very much dependent on the West. And uh, what this war is doing, the war in Ukraine, is uh, terminating that dependence. And that comes with a lot of pain, huge uh, dislocations, um, huge deficits, um, I would say, uh, um, a lot of people are put in a very hard place as a result of all that. With regards to China, uh, this uh, the uh, thesis, um, I think we have been hearing it for many years now. And I took it uh, in the 2000s when it first appeared uh, as a means to um, you know, send a message to the Russians that uh, you guys are becoming, uh, you know, junior partners at best, vassals, or a tributary state uh, to China. So a sort of psychological pressure, if you like, that uh, the countries in the West who really had enormous influence in Russia were exercising uh, with, 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 uh, with the aim of uh, uh, you know, making the Russian people um, wary of China, because it's one thing to be dependent on the West, which is kind of, uh, you know, uh, the West always thought of itself as uh, being superior to Russia. And the many Russians believed uh, that the West was superior to them. So being uh, dependent on a superior player was, uh, you know, was, was nothing unusual. Now, China, uh, for many reasons, was regarded as, uh, uh, in Russia, as a country that economically, technologically was much inferior to Russia when it was called the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union. So, uh, you know, to be dependent on China was uh, uh, something that uh, people took with a lot more shame than being dependent on the likes of the United States or Germany or you name it. Uh, right now, I think uh, I have one big uh, argument against that thesis. And the argument is uh, this. When uh, President Putin went to China in February 22 for the Olympics, uh, of course, he had a meeting with uh, um, Xi Jinping and um, they discussed a lot of things, but uh, President Putin never asked for permission 
to uh, to launch a special military operation in Ukraine. Had the relationship been that of a vassal and uh, uh, the, the the superior power, he would have not only mentioned that he would have sought uh, China's approval of such a major step, which China did not did not initially did not immediately support and does not uh, formally support today. Uh, and uh, ever since uh, the uh, Russian-Chinese relationship does not suggest that China has leverage with Russia where it matters. And that means uh, the conduct of the war, that means relations with the West and a number of other things. This should be put alongside the obvious reliance. I wouldn't call it dependence. I would say reliance by Russia on China uh, for technology, for uh, trade, finance, and many other things. At this point, this the reliance does not mean dependence. Uh, looking years ahead, I should say that if Russia does not develop uh, its own capabilities in a number of areas where those cap capabilities were not uh, were not present uh, since the days of the Soviet Union, then this reliance can turn to a dependence, which is which would be a bad thing. But uh, something tells me that this uh, spirit of uh, sovereignty that has been enhanced enormously by the war in Ukraine will also work to uh, develop Russian capabilities in the future that would uh, allow Russia not to be dependent on China, maybe reliant for a few things, for maybe for quite a few things, but reliance to me does not mean dependence. So let me let me stop here. I can add my five cents. You got me? Yep. Okay, go ahead. I can add my five cents if, I, if I'm permitted, if I'm allowed it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there is a very famous joke. It probably would sound a banal, but as very famous uh, Russian uh, philosopher Lossky said, not all what is banal is wrong, and many banalities are just the truth. Yeah. Uh, world is created by God, the rest is made in China. Yeah. From this point of view, I think uh, many other countries developed on on, on China uh, on China uh, goods, uh, both uh, in consumer goods and in high tech. I will give you an example. Uh, I'm a member of one uh, informal volunteer movement here, and I regularly buy stuff for our armed forces uh, performing special military operation in Ukraine. And normally we are buying two types of things, tactical gloves and Shemax. You know what Russians call the Rafatka, you know, this uh, Arabic, uh, uh, Ar Arabic piece of uh, textile, which you can use either as a mask or uh, in some other ways. Uh, one is Arabic, uh, but made in China of very good quality. Uh, tactical gloves are designed uh, in the United States, but they are produced in China, and it's made in China, and I buy it from China. Yeah. Uh, so from this point of view, we probably can consider as a dependence. United States uh, government several times uh, told that uh, China is sending to Russia uh, non uh, non lethal, non military uh, goods uh, for its armed forces. I think. It, it's about garment or whatsoever, uh, but it can be both actually uh, uh, governmentally procured or like uh, procured like like your humble servant does. Um, as for uh, Chinese uh, inventory in, in, in Russian armed forces, uh, uh, I only see the civil cars, civil automobiles. Uh, made in China uh, with a, with an MOD plate here in downtown Moscow. 
but I haven't seen any military equipment uh, or even dual use equipment uh, mill mill uh, in uh, in the ranks of in, in Russian armed forces. Yeah, we all know about Iranian drones. Uh, I've heard about uh, certain types of other equipment, uh, but I'm not sure from where countries they come. That's why I will not be disclosing it. But as for dependence on Chinese, let's say, uh, ammunition uh, and some other equipment tailored for Minister of Defense or, or, or other power ministries, uh, I've never come across, at least so far. Probably in the future, this dependence will grow, but, but so far it's not a... a it's not materialized, at least to my best knowledge. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any any other questions? I don't see any, so I'll use my There position. is a question in the chat box. Oh, is it? Where is it? Oh, yes, from Nividita. Uh, do you want to ask it yourself or, or, or me to read it? Um, sure, Professor, I can ask. Thank you yeah, so much. That's good. Uh, so we, wanted... everyone knows that you exist. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask about how, um, uh, why is it that the rising tensions between India and China would not be a problem when it comes to expanding the agenda of SCO or BRICS? Or if SU and BRICS want to come together and form uh, some sort of a, a leadership group for the new world order, as the speakers were talking about. Because as far as I understand, India is not just worried about the rise of China, a more aggressive China on its borders for the border disputes, but also because India thinks this would hamper its future positioning in Asia, because India also has ambitions of playing a, mo a major role in the region. And because, uh, as uh, as we've noted, how Russia and China are getting closer, and Russia is not in the strongest position at the moment, um, the the fact that India needs a more powerful player to balance China, then U.S. seems to be the more logical partner, as uh, opposed to say getting um, closer to whether SCO or BRICS if it sees China as a partner uh, as a major. Uh, sort of uh, adversary. So I just wanted to get your opinion on why India and China tensions will not be a hindrance. Okay, so who who is going to answer this one about the rise of China? Uh I could China is, unfortunately is not represented here, but I hope we'll have uh, a Chinese speaker very soon. So, but now we can only listen to Chinese friends here from BRICS, and I think General Anand is one of them. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, do you want to say something? Yes, uh, and I would love to uh, hear, uh, after I have spoken, I would definitely love to hear a little bit from Professor Trenin and from uh, yourself, uh, Professor Lukin, also on the subject. But uh, by response to what Nivedeta has asked is, firstly, uh, uh, I think it's a very natural question, but it's brilliantly put across. So, um, yeah. Uh, we are looking at an, a coercive China in parts. Uh, I'll just put off my video. Yeah, so we are looking at China being coercive at times when it suits them. And at other times, China can be uh, a great deal maker as well. Uh, so one needs to understand where they play from a position of strength and also where they respect strength. And uh, possibly when you deal with players across the globe, as you do in, in the real world, but there will be all kinds. So if I may just put it very simply, we have to have them as neighbors. We can't choose our neighbors. At the same time, uh, we find that we do business with them and we do, they're one of our largest trading partners. Uh, we also meet them at various forums where we find our agendas converge. There is progress. 
where we find that there is something that needs to be sorted out, perhaps the progress may be slower or at times may not be there at all. But to think that one would really expect India to logically jump into a camp, whether it's the US camp or any other camp, uh, would really put India into a binding position unnecessarily. And therefore, India would like to go where its national interests lie. And therefore, whether the national interest is served by um, having our interactions with the US or whether it is served by having it with anyone else on the globe, I think we should go where it serves our interests best. Um, there may be a time uh, when the Americans threw out a question that said, either you're with us or against us. And it you know, became a very famous line. I don't hear that coming out of the US today. Uh, the US is also um, beginning to understand that there are many corners to, uh, to, to a geometric uh, play. And, and I'm sure that uh, they, would, they would not force us into that position. We do get pressured by them, and I'm aware of that, on certain occasions. And we have shared it with our other partners when that happens. But at the same time, we do let them know where our best security interests lie. So uh, in sum, I would say we need to play it best the way we see our interests going without jumping into any one camp as long as we can. I hope, Nivedita, that kind of uh, puts uh, some sort of a picture across to you. Yeah, thank you, sir. Yeah. That makes sense. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. The question was actually more about India than other countries, as I understand. So I don't. I'm not sure what India should do. I'm not in. I cannot speak for India, but I'm just interested where this idea comes from that China is an aggressive play on bilateral disputes. I mean, China is a rather peaceful country, in my view. It has never invaded anybody uh, since uh, at least late 1970s, unlike, say, uh, the United States and its allies. So how I, I, I'm not sure how supporting the United States, you are going to, uh, uh, to promote or to ensure a balance of power in this way. The uh, United States is, of course, much more powerful. So from the geopolitical point of view, or from balance of power theory, you should support China, actually. Uh, but I, I, of course, I understand the complexity of Indian, of Sino-Indian relations. Uh, and uh, General Anand has just said that it's not only confrontation, but also quite a bit of cooperation on various issues. Uh, so, uh, I think that the current Indian policy is quite wise, frankly. It's not pro-Chinese or pro-American, but it's basically pro-Indian. Uh, but it's my just uh, humble opinion. I don't. I'm not even an expert on India, uh, so I don't know. Maybe other Russian participants. I don't know if you have any ideas on that, uh, but if you don't. Uh, I actually wanted to ask the same kind of question, but maybe I ask uh, Professor Zhebit, uh, because others uh, more or less uh, spoke about it, and it's also on China. Uh, and what? how do they see in India China's role? Uh, how do they say in uh, Brazil uh, China's role as uh, an emerging non-Western strongest non-Western power, I would say. Okay, thank you for the question. It's a very interesting discussion I'm following uh, from the point of view of China and India. But uh, what I wanted to say that Brazilian relations with China, they have a certain equilibrium with the relations uh, between, the, uh, between uh, Brazil and the United States because uh, it's an equilibrium between the economic interests first and strategic uh, relationship, which exists uh, since a long time between Brazil and the hemispheric sphere of uh, security. 
and a new relationship, uh, which is economic and uh, uh, technological with China. Uh, during the uh, presidency of Bolsonaro, there was a certain uh, switch to uh, the American position because there was a, a declaration of this government to, when they said that China is too uh, uh, open, too, too uh, active in relations with uh, Brazil in terms of uh, economy and uh, uh, trade. And uh, uh, Chinese were very, very uh, active in, in the sense of trying to by Brazil, as they said, as he said, no? but this was not just a very sound um, uh, opinion about the relationship. Brazil and uh, China they have very strong relationship in in trade, and I would say that uh, when you uh, try to compare uh, this relationship uh, uh, between uh, uh, Brazil and other countries, Brazil is uh, uh, a positive in its trade with, with China. It's a very interesting factor when you say uh, who is more dependent, wh which country is more dependent, it's Brazil or it's uh, uh, China in this sense, if you have the trade, which is not uh, very equal in relations to China. And uh, uh, speaking about Russia and uh, the question which was, which was, which was put by uh, Mr. Sergei Ratchenko, uh, uh, if Russia is dependent, I, I should say the following. The dependence is uh, uh, understood uh, uh, as to the question of political independence. Political independence, I, I should say, is not so uh, evident. You, you, could say, you couldn't say that Russia depends politically on China. Economically, it's not exactly dependence, it's interdependence. So now the balance of this dependence is going to, to, to the side of China and not only China, other Eastern countries. And this is a natural reaction because of the sanctions and the big divide which was created between the West uh, and the, the other countries in terms of economic uh, divide. So. Uh, we must uh, think this, uh, this, um, these equations in terms of uh, strategic uh, relevance of these relations in the time we live in. It doesn't mean that dependence uh, is like uh, was in, it was in colonial times. Not that uh, 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 understanding. We live in the time when dependence uh, uh, develops first in the global uh, um, uh, uh, global uh, environment, and also it uh, develops in terms of uh, relationship with the countries. When you have BRICS uh, uh, community, I should say, this community determines that the countries would not step over the sovereignty and the uh, interests. They would try to balance their interests in their relationship. So I, I think that we should understand it in a more um, more advanced uh, vision of relations between the countries that want to build a new uh, uh, a new uh, architecture of relations, uh, and this architecture is uh, very uh, um, attractive to some countries which, which are looking to enter the BRICS. Uh, as was said, what uh, Mr. Trenin spoke about this and other speakers. That, that means that uh, this architecture is a new architecture that must be built not in the sense of dependency, but in the sense of interdependency first and also other types of relations which can be built in, in terms of, as, as, we, as we spoke, and I spoke about this, security relations and security in terms of development security and human security. So uh, my, my uh, underst uh, understanding of this is that Brazil, uh, uh, which, which is so far geographically from China, doesn't seem, it doesn't feel to be dependent on China, but the dependence in term of, terms of economy, for example, eh, it's very natural to understand because China produces uh, so much uh, economic goods, that uh, other countries need. But uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of trade, 
it's only 2% that uh, Brazil has in the trade balance of China. Is this dependence? I don't think so. It's just the state of things that we have in terms of the development of China as a big economic powerhouse. Yes, thank you very much for your answer. I actually I'm collecting uh, interesting formula and I think that, well, wording, I liked your wording when you said that uh, it's not uh, a, a dependence of Russia on China, but an interdependence with uh, the weight of balance going in the direction of China. Uh, I think I'm going to use this one in the future. <clears throat> so, uh, I do. Do we have any other question? I don't see any any questions, and actually, we're already discussing this problem, our problems here, for two hours. So I think we should actually come to an end. Uh, and uh, as <clears throat> my Chinese friends would say, I declare a victorious conclusion of our seminar. Uh, I hope we can see we can do it now. Of course, in this uh, in the current situation, it's not very easy to do it very often. But I think that we'll have uh, one the new one very soon, or perhaps we'll have even a Chinese a Chinese speaker, which is a very interesting because Chinese it's not very easy also to invite a Chinese speaker for various reasons, including the internal reason. Well, thank you very much, and see you all on our at our next seminar. Goodbye. Thank you.